We're trying something a little different today, and um, hopefully this is going to work out great, and we'll have more of these this semester and next semester. So the idea behind these showcases is we're going to have three or four people from uh, different uh, primary research areas to talk about what they're doing right now so that that we get a better sense of what's going on in the area. And today is family and parenting. And obviously we have a lot of faculty in this area who are not up here. So uh, another idea is that like next semester, we can have another one of these family and parenting panels with four of our other members. But this is a way to learn what's going, everybody's doing and we can talk to each other and even think about where we wanna go in the future. Like where do we wanna go next? Um, in this in this area where we need to hire, etc. So I am not going to uh, introduce each person because everybody here I can spend ten minutes talking about all their accomplishments. So I'm going to let each person introduce themselves and um, their affiliation, please. And we ha do have two people here from sociology and two from HDFS today. So um, who does have you decided who wants to start, or am I just going to like? Shannon is going to start, <laughs> and, and then we'll take it from there. Do I need a hand? Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. I might have to stand up because I'll get nervous and I'm better moving. Okay. So my name is Shannon Cavanaugh. I'm a professor of sociology. Um, I am the postdoctoral training director. Um, I've been, I am probably the most senior, the longest term PRC person in this room. I started at the PRC in 2002. I came here in 2002, which which makes me feel as though I should stand up and <laughs> my dominant. <laughs> yeah, I, um, I was still a graduate student, but I wrote my dissertation uh, here in a network uh, with other graduate students from uh, UT, and then I did a postdoc in HGFS as well as the Pop Center, and I've been on faculty since 2006. So yeah, God. Funny, you're usually the young one in the room, and now you're the old one. That's <laughs> the longest. It's pretty sobering. Okay, so my work I'm a family demographer by training. Um, I have long sort of thought about family as um, thinking a lot about children and adolescent well being, seeing the family as a kind of primary um, institution by which resources, time, money, um, love get passed from parents to children especially in the U.S. context, where the kind of work and cost of raising children is primarily private. So understanding how families look, um, and I spent a lot of time thinking about family structure, family composition, family change over time, uh, has been a kind of key part of my research area. Um, so that's sort of the, the work that I've done that's gotten that I've done my whole time at um, Texas. And I'm not really sure what I was supposed to do for this. I use this as an opportunity to whip together the front end of a paper that I, um, uh, Asia and I will be presenting submitting to PAA. Um, and this is work that um, is part of a broader project that I'm doing some comparative work, which I've not done before, but um, really it's anchored in the US context thinking about um, the mothers and children and how that sort of experience looks in a, in a context of changing family um, relationships. Um, in particular, I'm interested in thinking about uh, maternal depression, how that um, is experienced in kind of during, during this period of intensive parenting, using a word that I heard Christy talk about in her job talk about the rush hour, which I think is an incredible way to think about mothering during this period of life. We think about um, in older, the older part of the life course, but what's happening to women in their 30s and 40s while they're responsible for this sort of intensive parenting. Um, and so, uh, and we know that there's higher levels of depression for women uh, and, and sort of general um, stress and anxiety. Um, and so what I'm interested in doing is looking at, um, or Asya and I are looking at trajectories of depression in a set of birth cohorts across the early life course to understand what those um, 
processes look like? Because much of the work that focuses on mothers and depression focuses on the, um, post, uh, the, the postnatal depression, but we know that women continue to be depressed well beyond that period. Um, we also know that depression is socially patterned with disadvantaged women reporting higher rates of depression than others. Um, and so the, the project was to sort of leverage other, na other nationally representative birth cohorts to look at um, the way these processes unfold similarly or differently across contexts in settings that are also considered liberal welfare states, but there that do have some differences in the degree to which parenting is a private enterprise. So using data from the UK, Australia, um, New Zealand, where they have things like universal child care, um, health care, other things that can absorb some of the costs. The idea is that maybe that trajectory looks different. Those trajectories of maternal depression look different in different settings. Because um, while intensive mothering exists across these uh, settings and maternal depression is elevated in these settings, we might see differences um, in how those trajectories unfold in these different contexts. The other thing that I'm now thinking a lot more about, and really it came out of this really lovely um, amount of work, that, work that's coming out related to um, critical race theory is thinking about, I'm thinking here about work by Kristen Cross um, and um, Regina Baker about thinking about structural racism and misogyny and the role in this. Um, and how that is part of the broader story. And so what I'm really excited about thinking about these trajectories, both cross nationally, but thinking carefully about how structural racism, how the systems of misogyny are helping to explain the socially patterned differences in things like control depression. So that's kind of where we are. We're working on those trajectories right now, um, but that that's what I'm thinking about. I'm also doing a lot of administrative stuff, but I'm trying to think a little bit more about families in that kind of way. So is that good, guys? Okay. Right. Yeah. Hi, I'm Lisa Neff. I'm an associate professor in human development and family sciences. And so, yeah, when Deb asked me to be part of this, I thought I'd just tell you a little bit about sort of the broad questions I address and sort of the data sets I'm, I'm collecting in my lab and working with. And in a nutshell, uh, my research focuses on marriage and couples relationship dynamics and how couples relationship functioning can change and develop over time. So I have sort of two lines of research in this area. Uh, one area that I've probably spent more of my career publishing on is the study of newlywed marriage. So we've done uh, a lot of work looking at those early years of marriage with the idea that uh, in our experience, when you talk to newlyweds, I don't know if you've interviewed a lot of them, but at the beginning of their relationship, they're all very much in love and very committed to making that relationship last. But unfortunately, we know that all that unbridled optimism doesn't necessarily translate into relationship success. The good news is we know the divorce rate has been coming down over the past few decades, but still about 40% of marriages end in divorce. And a lot of marriages, if they divorce, uh, have those divorces happen in those first two to three years. So those early years of marriage seem to be a critical transition period for the couple. So we're studying newlyweds over those first four years of the marriage. We get them at about the first six months that they've uh, been married and track them every six months for four years getting all kinds of data from them. So we get uh, every six months, we'll get a giant questionnaire packet on uh, everything we can think of to ask them about their life and their relationship. And then also about once a year, we have them come into our labs and we videotape them engaging in a series of conversations about important issues in the relationship. So we have them talk about sources of conflict or tension. So we can look at couples conflict resolution strategies. We also have them talk about maybe personal issues or goals they're trying to achieve. So we can look at support exchanges in the relationship. How good are people at asking their partner for support and providing it when asked? Um, and then we usually, after those lab interactions, send them home with a two week daily diary task. So we can look at day-to-day uh, -day processes in the relationship as well. So we do this uh, multiple times and with the newlywed data, one of the uh, big angles that we're looking at is the role of stress 
and the way it can affect the way that couples think and behave within the relationship. So how does stress from other life domains, work, dealing with your extended family, neighborhood context, how do those stressors spill over to change the way we interact with our relationship partner? And so we've got a lot of different projects working on this idea. I have a student right now looking at uh, how stress from other life domains can interfere with uh, physical affection and sexual intimacy within the relationship. Uh, we've uh, had a lot of work coming out recently looking at the way stress can change what we even see and notice in our relationship. So in a paper coming out later this month, we found that uh, at times when couples are experiencing more stress, they become especially vigilant to day-to-day -day changes in their partner's negative behaviors, but not their partner's positive behaviors. In other words, stress seems to shift your attentional focus toward those more inconsiderate exchanges in the relationship. And not only are we more likely to notice those inconsiderate exchanges, when we do notice them, we behave less forgivingly in response to them when we're experiencing more stress. We're more likely to blame our partner as opposed to forgive them. We're more likely to engage in critical forms of communication. We also have found that uh, stress can disrupt support processes in some interesting ways. So along those lines of how stress changes what you see in the relationship, in addition to sort of tuning you into your partner's negative behaviors, Stress seems to make you less aware or less attentive to day-to-day -day changes in your partner's support desires. How much does your partner want or desire support from you? When we're stressed, we're less accurate in determining that. And even if we do know that our partner wants support, if we're stressed, we're less likely to give it on those days. So we, we're finding uh, ways that uh, stress can interfere with those uh, important support exchanges in the relationship as well. So that's sort of a little bit about one line of research. In another area of research I've recently uh, embarked on, we, we call it the Relationship Experiences Across the Lifespan Project. Um, one of my fabulous colleagues in the department, Hannah Williamson, published a paper recently looking at the kinds of samples used in a lot of the literature on couples' relationships published in top journals. Found a lot of problems, but one of the things uh, that she discovered was that less than 6% of studies have focused on couples over the age of 50. And if you know anything about aging and adult development, you know that there are important aging theories about how our motivation shift, our priorities shift as we get older. It affects the way we approach our interpersonal relationships. And so we've become interested in understanding uh, changes in how couples may respond to challenges in the relationship. And one thing we noticed uh, when looking at the literature that does exist, is a lot of work on couples who are uh, you know, older tends to focus on married couples. So this is uh, an interesting uh, in two ways. One, it means that when you're comparing older and younger couples, age and relationship length are confounded because the older couples are always have been married longer than the younger couples. So it's a little hard to untangle the extent to which age is uh, affecting those differential processes or it's having been with the same person for a longer period of time, but also it's overlooking an important demographic that is growing in our society and that is older dating couples. So people are living longer and uh, there are, compared to previous decades, more older adults are dating again and trying to understand what the process of forming a new relationship in later life looks like. So we did this project with those sort of limitations of the existing literature in mind. And we uh, got a sample of just under 300 couples. Um, about two thirds of the sample are in long-term married relationships. So they've been married at least 10 years. The married sample age range is between uh, 30 and 88. And we were very deliberative in making sure we had equal numbers of sort of younger, middle-aged, older couples. So a nice distribution there. But we also have uh, the other third of the sample is uh, couples in newly formed dating relationships. So the median length of their relationship is about nine months. And again, the age range is from 30 to our oldest couple was 87. So we've got a good distribution, very deliberative in how we were recruiting those uh, couples as well. And so that allows us not only to try to understand are there you know, age versus relationship length differences in how couples 
approach challenges in the relationships, how they deal with stressors in the relationship, but also a way to help us understand the uniqueness of uh, forming relationships in later life and comparing uh, older and younger couples in those new relationships. Um, so that is data that we just finished up with right before the pandemic, and we've been a little, we're just starting to sort of dig into it the past couple of years, and so that's a project we're currently working on. Yeah. Hi everyone, I'm um, Jordan Conwell. I'm assistant professor in the Department of Sociology. Um, this is my second year here at UT. I was previously on the faculty at the University of Wisconsin for four years and affiliate of the Pop Center um, there. I brought slides. I'm relatively new, so I'm still in a very rule following <laughs> mode. Um, my long term plan is to follow rules strictly for a short period of time and then begin backsliding. So, be prepared for that. Um, yeah, I. Apparently, they're a good role models here for that. So that's exciting. Um, so uh, I might have been a more natural fit for the education panel, but I can't make that. Um, so Deb was very kind to invite me to this panel. But actually, the more I thought about this, um, at the moment, what I'm working on is um, has more to do with um, families and households and generations than it does to do um, with education. So I'm actually excited to be part of uh, this panel, um, I've just called this short talk, financial returns of higher education, bringing families back in. Uh, we'll see if our slides are gonna go, no. Click. Okay, here we go. Um, so I'm a sociologist. I study race, class, and gender inequality in education, um, families, and finances. Um, currently, I'm working on the issue of household financial returns to college quality. Um, so this is an idea that sociologists call horizontal stratification. So it, yes, it matters whether you go to college or not, but if you go to college, it also matters a great deal where you go to college for a lot of reasons. Um, there are a number of things in your life that might be different if you go to UT Austin versus UT San Ann versus tech versus ACC, right? Um, the one that social scientists have been most interested in historically is how this matters for your income. Um, and so this is work largely conducted by economists, um, trying to identify effects of what is can be called college quality or college selectivity or college prestige, um, net of all of the things that select people into different colleges. Um, these effects generally exist um, and they're generally pretty large. Uh, most of this work uh, has focused on individuals' incomes, um, and most of it has also not focused on race and gender heterogeneity in these trends. Um, so my frequent collaborator, Natasha Quadlin, and I had this paper that came out in Social Forces um, last year, where we were looking at um, individual income returns to college selectivity um, separately by race and gender, but still looking at individual incomes. Um, and from this graph here, you might notice um, that it looks like for Black women, for example, as college selectivity increases, income is kind of increasing linearly, um, but that's not the case for white women. Um, this is puzzling because this doesn't seem to be an accurate statement of the lived economic realities of black and white women. Um, and what, of course, is missing from this is thinking about family or household outcomes. Um, so what we're doing in um, a, recent, a study that we actually just finished um, is looking at returns to college quality or selectivity for household income. Um, thinking about families also allows us to think about household wealth. Um, which is determined across multiple generations of a family, um, but is also highly relevant to access and returns to college selectivity, um, and then debt as well, which is also multi-generationally determined, but highly relevant to access and returns to college. Um, this also allows us to bring a literature on what sociologists call horizontal stratification, which is different colleges versus vertical stratification, which is whether you go to college or not, um, with literatures on things like assortative mating, for example. Um, you get a lot of things from going to college or going to grad school. One of the things that you might get is a partner who went to that same college. Um, so we care whether people with BAs or people with BAs, but if people who go to UT Austin make more on average than people who go to tech, 
we also care whether people who go to UT Austin marry each other versus people who went to tech marrying each other, right? So we care a lot about that. Uh, as you might imagine, this gives us a very different perspective on how college and um, you know different quality or different selectivities of college are fitting into the socioeconomic life courses of black and white men and women. Um, so we see different patterns here. So this is now a continuous measure of college selectivity. Um, we see very different patterns of household income per capita. I thank the FAMDEM folks for um, putting me on to thinking about per capita. I presented some of this last year at FAMDEM. Um, so household income per capita, we can also think about wealth, which is actually really staggering here. So we're not trying to attribute um, household wealth to attendance at a certain college, right? That's not the point. The point is just descriptively, what are the median wealth holdings of young adult black and white men and women who went to colleges that we can statistically equalize the quality or selectivity of those colleges, right? So we see for black and white women, for example, um, virtually the median wealth is, is basically zero, whether you went to a low quality four-year college or an elite four-year college. Um, and we see obviously for white men and women uh, that household wealth is increasing, at least not as a function of, but correlated with the quality of the four-year college that you attend. Um, and we see some notable differences here actually between um, white men and white women that we feel like have not really been appreciated a lot in literature and wealth to date. Um, we can also look at um, household non-housing debt. So most of this is educational debt, although not all of it is. Um, and we see a story that we've been talking about recently in terms of educational debt in particular, um, which is for black women, um, household non-housing debt increasing as a function of, of the quality of the four-year college attended. Um, we can also think about trying to explain these differences. I won't go through this um, in a lot of detail, uh, but when we try to see what is responsible, for example, um, for differences in household wealth between black and white men and women who went to colleges at say the median of college quality, um, we end up seeing some counterintuitive findings. Like for example, family financial background actually accounts for more of the difference between white women and white men than between black women and white men. And this is because of different race and gender and ability sorting across colleges having to do with affirmative action and other things. Um, so some interesting counterintuitive patterns there. Um, I think we're supposed to give a commercial report we're looking for, but so I'm going to do that. Um, I am looking for collaborators, um, including research assistants interested in um, issues, including, but certainly not limited to, um, higher education, household finances, um, income, wealth, and debt, um, intergenerational mobility, what we call this in sociology. Um, I think demographers would refer to this as multi-generational stratification, kind of following the kind of Rob Mayer or Fabian Pfeffer ideas. Uh, I'm very attracted to this notion of thinking about, you know, um, late Rob Mayer that's saying that we should think about families um, as dynasties, particularly in terms of their finances. And so I'm very interested in um, the role of education in family financial dynasty um, and race and gender heterogeneity and how education, particularly higher education, um, fits into family financial dynasties across generations. Um, some of the data sets that I use, um, some of these are actually aspirational, would like to use if one of you knows how to use them. Um, NLSY, PSID, SIP, um, obviously some very interesting resources here to work with on some of these questions, the RDC, the Education Data Center, um, and the like. So um, looking forward to, to questions with the panelists and please be in touch if any of this is um, compelling to you. Thanks. Hello everyone, hi, I'm Fatima Barner. I'm an assistant professor in human development and family sciences. I'm happy to be here today. Um, most of my research focuses on the role of race-related stressors and other stressors in the lives of Black families. So I look at both parents and adolescents. I typically look at families with adolescents, um, particularly because with race-related stressors, adolescence is a time when my adolescents are aware of social stratification and um, often they experience more discrimin racial discrimination or at least are aware of that discrimination. Um, I'm really interested in looking at the links between parents and adolescents' racial discrimination experiences, as well as other stressors like vicarious discrimination. So when people witness or hear uh, or learn about others' racial discrimination experiences and anticipated discrimination. Um, and with anticipated discrimination, I'm interested in both um, parents' anticipation of their own discrimination experiences, as well as the anticipation of discrimination for their children. Um, and I'm interested in how these experiences influence parent-adolescent interaction, parenting, 
and as well as adolescent outcomes like academic achievement, psychological outcomes, and parent mental health as well. Um, I study in terms of parenting, I look at both general or more universal parenting practices like parental involvement and authoritative parenting. But I also look at race specific parenting practices like racial socialization or the messages that parents give their children about race. I examine the role of gender in these processes and have found some interesting things looking at um, the gender of both parents and adolescents in terms of how it's related to the links between race related stressors and um, adolescent outcomes. And increasingly in my lab, we're looking at the role of context like neighborhood, school, and work characteristics, particularly racial composition. And then more recently, I have done some work looking at white families, exploring parent and peer influences on the development of anti-racist ideology among white adolescents. And so one paper was recently published with um, C.R. Small Clover from Georgia State and Child Development. And so um, I would say in my work, what is distinctive is I'm interested in looking at a more broad range of race-related stressors um, beyond racial discrimination, um, or personal racial discrimination experiences. Um, and I'm also interested in these bi-directional influences, so how parents experiences both their children and, and vice versa. Um, we've had some interesting findings that it's, I don't this have slides of you know more informal, but um some of the interesting findings that we published more recently in my lab are that um, vicarious racial discrimination sources matter for parents' health. And so when um, parents learn or witness their children experiencing racial discrimination, that was more related to, to, to the parents' depressive symptoms, while witnessing or learning about discrimination on media was more related to their self-rated health. Um, also, um, in our lab, in a recent publication, we found that um, Black parents who had low racial discrimination experiences, but who had sons who had high racial discrimination experiences, were more likely to change their parenting or their um, involvement over time, while parents of girls and parents who have had high racial discrimination experiences didn't differ. And so I'm, I'm interested in learning more about what are the mechanisms um, affecting those, those differences based on gender um, and people's racial discrimination experiences. Um, in my work, I've used secondary data analysis. So I've used the Maryland Adolescent Development and Context Study as well as the National Longitudinal Survey of Youth, 79, um, a lot as well, and with the NLSY 79, um, the children and young, young adults um, sample. And I've also, excuse me, collected online samples. So um, I collected one sample um, with Black parents online um, in 2018 that looked at race-related stressors, parenting, and adolescent outcomes. And then in this, earlier this year, um, we collected data that also looked at activism. Um, so we have information on race-related stressors, activism, and other coping strategies that parents use. And um, in the future, I plan to link that to parenting um, and parent psychological health. And one of my students, Pete Holloway, recently finished a dissertation with that data, looking at um, how race-related stressors were related to um, parents' activism. Um, so those are some things that are going on. Um, right now, I'm finishing up a meta-analysis in which April Benner and Natasha Burmas are co-PIs. That's a little bit um, not as parenting and family-focused, but that meta-analysis is looking at the link between school-based marginalization and academic achievement, as well as social behavioral competencies in K-12 schools. And so as that's wrapping up, <laughs> finally, um, I'm in the planning stages with my lab um, in terms of looking planning data collection with Black parents and adolescents. We're planning to do a daily diary study, examining um, race-related stressors, social support, and um, interactions such as communication and conflict. Um, and then lastly, I also am I'm working with Korea Jabbar in education, um, in the School of Education here in Fairland Hall at Wayne State on a school choice experiment that was um, funded by PRC, <laughs> so thank you PRC. And we did a survey experiment with different formats displaying info about schools to see how satisfied um, parents were about their school choices. Um, also in that study, we did qualitative interviews of parents, and so we're currently writing that work up. So um, I'm really excited and about hearing more and hearing your ideas. 
Um, the other last thing is, again, I'm, I'm really interested in coping as well. And so um, more recently, I've been examining um, coping such as superwoman schema, um, as well as high, other forms of high for coping, um, and linking it to both physical and psychological health. So those are some different strains of research I'm doing, and I just open it up around other It's so cool to hear what everybody's doing. We're all so separated from each other. It's really nice. Uh, so we're going to follow the tradition. The first couple of questions from graduate students. You know who you are. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Um, Jordan, I thought your presentation was so interesting. And um, Thank you. Uh, uh, <laughs> um, I, I, I thought your graphics were really compelling as well. And I was wondering in that per uh, capita calculation you mentioned, if you're seeing differences based on, obviously the calculation kind of takes into account marital status if a household has two people. Mm -hmm. But are you seeing differences versus like people that stay single and are kind of all, it's all their finances are them versus people that are married? kind of diversified their finances and debt maybe yeah i mean so there's a, something that we're not looking at now that would be interesting going in the future is more of this trajectories thing right so instead of looking at we're looking right now like well what what was happening when you most recently reported something to the also had any sentiment right and then one of the things that we look at as a mechanism is like the share of waves you've reported being partnered or never partnered with someone who had a ba uh, but there's obviously like a more complicated level of core story that could be told and modeled there. Mm -hmm. um, related to that, I also have become from this interested in like our theoretical point is that the household is the realm of the economic well being, like at least objectively, right? Like the administrative state taxes us at that level. Um, if I make no money, then my partner makes a lot. Like I might feel a certain way about that subjectively, which is kind of thing getting up. That's important to think about like subjective perceptions of well being, especially in households where um, breadwinning is very unequal. But there's also this objective fact that I'm a member of a, of a high income household. And I think those points also relate to those trajectories um, as my pooling changed over time, as my partnership changed over time. So I think the short answer is no, we haven't, but um, we are interested to do so. Thank you. Um, you mentioned at the very end of your talk about superwoman schema, and I feel like I can sort of speculate what that means, but I think we need to talk a little bit more about that. Sure, yeah, I know I just kind of dropped it and didn't say much more about it. So, um, with the superwoman schema work, I'm actually working with Cheryl Woods Gisbombe at UNC, and she developed a measure of superwoman schema, which um, so other people may have heard of the strong black woman. Um, um, you know, but basically, it's a coping framework that is related to some of the challenges that Black women have, and it consists of five different um, subscales. So it has um, motivation to succeed, or high motivation to succeed, obligation to present strength, obligation to help others, even to the point of um, neglecting self-care, um, obligation to predict vulnerability, and emotional suppression. And in some of the work we're doing now, also with David Che at Tulane, we found that in a sample of black women with lupus, that um, there were different patterns in regards to their endorsement of these um, subscales, as well as their socioeconomic well-being. And so there were some women who had who didn't really endorse any of the subscales and had moderate socioeconomic status. There were women who endorsed um, obligation to present strength and motivation to succeed, and they had the highest socioeconomic resources, and they had the least um, disease activity. And then there are women who are high across the board in the um, superwoman subscales, and they had the lowest, um, they had the fewest socioeconomic resources, and they had the highest disease activity. And so it's really interesting, um, and we want to do more looking at longitudinally. Um, that was one cross-sectional, that was one way. Um, but it's interesting because the majority of the women were in that, that um, profile that endorsed all the um, subscales highly and had fewer resources. And so that does suggest um, that it is a common framework that people, um, or that framework does um, represent something that Black women are engaging in 
and that it can be detrimental to some physical health outcomes, but not all of the aspects are. So in it, we need to learn more about, um, you know, is it if women have the obligation to succeed and they want to present strength, but they have the resources, is that okay? Or, you know, is it okay to endorse these, uh, these things if you have lower resources? So we want to disentangle that more, um, but um, I'm really interested and excited to be looking more at physical health because I've done more research looking at psychological outcomes and academic achievement in the past. Well, all of that is tied to this, I mean, all that work on like, intensive mothering and, and how I think that like early on that was really kind of seen as a class-based logic, but it, it it persists across social class and it's part of the sort of social construction of gender and how women and part of the kind of heteropatriarchy deal that has been set that that make women really unwell, right? Like so thinking about the sort of broader structural factors when and then the way that women cope and it's not very good for their health. Yeah, yeah. especially the emotion suppression and yeah. the um lack of self-care with the caregiving. Yeah. So, um I mean this framework has been conceptualized more for black women. Um but it's also be interesting to see, you know, are we finding unique things for black women versus mm -hmm. other women? Mm -hmm. Um another student of mine, Elizabeth Jelsma, she looked at women versus men using the same scale and um it didn't it the measurement is <laughs> not the same, and so it does mean that this is something that that strongly differs from us. I think men have a question. Yeah, <clears throat> I have a question for you, and thank you so much for your talk today. Um, regarding the social determinants of maternal depression, like a, at the macro level, could you um, tell us more about the reason why you chose four? countries like liberal welfare state by countries about like how about maternal depression pattern or trajectory in like conservative welfare state or um countries with high gender discrimination in the labor market so data <laughs> i think it's the, the answer is that I mean, when I, and I'm certainly not a cross-national scholar, so this is sort of new for me, but I, I wanted to anchor it in the U.S., and when you come up with a cross-national study, you want to make the countries as much alike as you can, and so these are all, I mean, they all had sort of similar data sets available following cohorts over time. Um, they all are similar to some degree in that they have relatively um, weak supports for families. So like if I threw Sweden in there, it would really kind of junk up the thing because it looks very different. But those countries that I mentioned all have relatively weak supports for families. I mean, much more supports than they do in the U.S., but because they're like enough, you can begin to kind of think about them. You can make comparisons um, in that way. Um, so that was really the motivation and, and that there were data available. Um, so you want a lot when you do kind of comparative work. If you wanted to look at it, particularly in a place that provides more, um, more generous welfare supports, then I, you wouldn't compare that to the U.S. because they, of course, they would look different. And so you want to sort of set it up. So that was the the logic there, um, and also the data were available. And that also matters a lot too. Sometimes. Thank you. We have a question online. Yeah. Okay, so Ka uh, Catherine Wiley asks a question for Lisa. Is she studying straight and queer newlyweds? Uh, if both, then is she seeing any differences in how the groups handle stress? I did not have, sorry, uh, I did not have a, uh, a sample of both straight and queer. So I haven't been able to look at that, but I, I think Deb might have some data that it would be really fascinating to uh, compare groups in terms of uh, handling stress. So I was not able to look at that thing. Um, hi, I'm Kylie, I'm a university student. I also have a question for Chen um, regarding the um, social setting that affect maternal depression. Um, so when you said social settings affect maternal depression, what would be the example of um, like the core five social settings? I don't know. I don't know what you might be referring to in the social setting. I'm sorry. So it would be like policy? 
Oh, oh, yes. Yeah. So thinking about the what I'm thinking about are policies, the differences, the different policy environment in those settings, how they might um, operate to absorb some of the stress, so that there are obvious expectations uh, of brown mothering. Um, which could be stressful for all women, but when you have that could be that much more stressful theoretically if there's no if you have limited access to childcare, if you have limited access to health um, insurance, if you have limited access to paid leave, um, all of which can exacerbate and make um, on the one hand exacerbate stresses, on the other hand make one's own individual status in terms of education, marital status. Um, even more important because it's all up to you in this sort of neoliberal um, context where it, how well a kid does increasingly depends on how well his mother or father are doing and the kinds of resources. So to the, to the idea is that in states where more of the, um, the, the, the work and the costs of raising children are absorbed by the state, then you should see less discrimination based on things like family structure or education. But in a country like the US where there's fewer supports from the state, a lot of that inequality that you observe with, across families is driven by differences in, in characteristics of parents. You also look at like culture factors and see a lot of inequality in the states. Yes, <laughs> certainly you could look at things. I mean, you're, I mean, it's, I'm using individual level data, so it's, you know, there's trickiness of capturing norms and things like that, but yeah. All right, uh, Patricia Homan's structural sexism score is pretty easy to calculate with public data, so it might be helpful. Exactly, and that would be the kind of thing that I want to start bringing those kinds of things in. Yes, yes, yes. Do you want to have a question? And then I have a question. Yeah, um, Shannon, I was curious about you know, this flying in at 30,000 30, feet with your demographers. Have you thought about using the American time use surveys as a way of kind of getting a trajectory of simulating cohort experiences, the rush hour phenomena for women? I would, I have been know? wanting to do that for a very long time. So that is definitely something. I mean, I wouldn't do it in this kind of cross national context, but yeah. going deeper in, and I spent a lot of time, many years looking at parenting measures, and I've never. Or I've never been terribly lucky in explaining anything, so I think time use is really the way to it's tricky, capture. It's just a thought. I mean, yeah. the other thing I was going to suggest is that you were interested in this policy environment, and one of the things that sociologists often, we often forget about, is how EITC, state level EITC, was rolled out differently, and it was adopted at different time periods, and so it's kind of like a little experiment Absolutely. Yeah. in the world where you can leverage the variability of the state level EITs, earn income tax credit, sorry, mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. that, that, that helps, uh, especially families on the low end, mm -hmm. in grappling with some of the, the stresses of parenting, so anyway. Absolutely, thank you. So I have a question about the field. Um, so it wasn't planned, but each of you brought up well-being, mental health. Um, and I'm wondering if that's a, is there a demography of mental health? I mean, does demography get submissions that talk about mental health? Because it feels like that's something that a lot of people in our center do, is look at mental health. <laughs> no, we, and we don't. And I think uh, it's a real short, it's a it is a real problem. So the issues of the you know, the loneliness, um, anxieties, depressive symptoms. So our our understanding, our kind of basic demography of these phenomena is really it's surprisingly bad. And so I think if there's a and we're much better at figuring it out by physical health, right? So mm -hmm. it, it's a problem. Yeah, I was shocked. I went I went looking and just trying to build this literature review and I, nothing was written. I mean, there are like, there's lots of medical um, yeah. pieces on samples of 200 people. I mean, but nothing from like 2005, I guess we stopped worrying about uh, women's mental health yeah. because there's real, and then there's this, a bunch around COVID, but there is a huge, just a drop off, uh, which is sort of surprising. Yeah. There are the substance abuse. Serve national substance abuse surveys, which you may be able to do something with 
They're usually not on our the demographers' radar screens, but they're they're available. So you you know, in terms of like and especially substance abuse, suicide ideation, yeah. things like that. So. Yep, and that's not unrelated to this exactly. at all. Can I ask Lisa a question? I happen to know that you've done a study on COVID and stress mm -hmm. couples. So if you want to say a little bit about what you found so far? Sure. Um, so yeah, we did do uh, a study of, you know, at the beginning of the lockdown, my colleague Marcy Gleason and I, we were, you know, discombobulated like everybody. And then realized, oh dear, we study stress and support in couples. We have to do a study right now. So we just compounded our own stress by trying to do that as quickly as possible. Um, so yeah, we did a, a daily diary study of uh, couples' experiences during uh, the early stages of the lockdown, and we were approaching it from the idea that not all stressful events are the same. So you know, I've done a lot of work on sort of daily hassles and everyday stressors, and how that they're really insidious because they tend to affect us without our awareness, and so they they color the way we think and behave, and we don't really correct for it because we're not always aware that it's happening. However, major uh, events, and this has been shown in the literature on natural disasters, there's been literature on hurricanes, seem to operate differently in that uh, you see a lot of different findings. Sometimes those major events are harmful to the relationship, sometimes they have no effect, and sometimes they actually have a positive effect on relationships. It's kind of all over the place. And one of the differences uh, uh, that's been theorized is your awareness of the stressful event and how it's affecting you. And so we were looking because COVID was the perfect circumstance to test this idea that when stressors are highly salient, when they affect a lot of people and they're completely uncontrollable, that might be a different set of circumstances and how it affects your relationship. And that under those circumstances, couples might be more likely to blame the stressor for their problems than to blame each other. And turning that blame onto the stressor might actually mitigate stress spillover in the relationship. And that's basically what we found during that time, that you saw blame, not many blaming attributions happening, which often happens in couples. Uh, those blaming attributions were coming down. People were more likely to blame the pandemic for their relationship troubles, and that reduced the size of the effect between their daily stressors and their relationship behaviors and happiness during that time. Can I ask uh, Jordan a question? So Jordan, you had a list of things which I think are like major future important agenda items that uh, all of us in this room should be thinking about. Probably the one that sticks in my mind the most has to do with uh, intergenerational mobility and what's go has gone, what's going on now because we're in a period of history compared to the 20th century where most people were moving up. Now we're in a period of time where we're seeing some movement up, some generational advantage that's continued, some that's generational advantage that's also continued, but people are moving up and down. And we simply don't, I don't think we understand how this is operating in the context of families and how it plays out in terms of family stressors. So, you know, I, I applaud you and I, it, it's, it's a tough issue because we have things like educational expansion and changes in wage inequality, which are, so all this stuff is hard to measure, but um, anytime you want to push this angle, I think it would be worth, you know, from a center standpoint, having a kind of larger conversation about it, because I think a bunch of us would be interested in just chatting about how do we deal with these issues? I think we should about it. Many of us are grappling with them, but we're in our own little, like I'm in my little health sideline, right? But we're definitely grappling with that issue, which is like so no, I, that's that's great. I mean, I think we should. Um, you know, there's been an as as sociologists have moved from thinking um, just about income and just about parent-child correlations, and in particular, father-son correlations, to now thinking about wealth. That's pushing us into three generations, ending up in a place where demographers already were. Right. Um, one of the reasons that it might be helpful to get together on this is the data challenges are just immense. So this yeah. is why some of the work that folks like uh, Z Song and Deirdre Bloom do with actually figuring out what sounds kind of simple, like it sounds simple to say, well, let's just think about families as dynasties and let's look at three, four, five, six generations and financial stuff, health stuff, what have you. Um, but the data challenge is immense. Um, you actually would need a team to kind of put a data set together that everyone could pull on for different things yeah. um, to really make it work. 
I mean, I'm, I'm revising a paper now. I don't know if it's due in two or three so. <laughs> Okay. But yeah, we, 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 we should keep talking about it if folks are interested. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's a thought um, when you're showing your graphs. It's really interesting the differences to like in debt. I mean, with black men, yeah. black women, competitive. I was curious about like, your thoughts about those differences. Yeah. So I wrote, um, again, my frequent collaborator in Township Quad and I had a paper that came out in Social Event last year looking at. Um, high school is about this so once we start thinking about race and gender in college we get these these weird patterns right so um on average black boys and girls come from relatively similar socioeconomic backgrounds um but on average black girls do way better in k-12 than black boys um, this means that like an average college going black girl or woman is from a more disadvantaged background than the average college going black boy, right? And so that has a lot of interesting effects when we start thinking about debt and again, how does higher education fit into family dynasties, right? It's not just a race thing. Um, and it might not just be a race and gender thing, but it's certainly at least a racialized and gender thing. These patterns are very, very different. Um, yeah, so like we've written a little bit about that, but we can talk about it. That's, but that's why, I mean, it's kind of a perverse consequence of Black girls and women outperforming their social background so much more than uh, Black men. Would this hold for Latinx? I mean, would you, like... I would assume, I would assume so, but I haven't looked, that would be an interesting kind of thing to work, but I would, I would strongly assume so, but I don't, I don't know. And uh, I'm not about working with um, that on her project on the computer. I mean, I think uh, we have so I'm really excited to get that extension. Uh, we're working a project on like uh, a couple of the married and non national and very relationships. I was wondering if you are expecting or any other findings show that among the age line of older adults who are in relationships, I mean, there's a difference between those who or you know the on or in a marital relationship like, and got out of it it's either because of either who was on board versus who was not married and not in the relationship and, and kind of the like that that's a really interesting question um and it turns out you know who were the couples who you know were were dating that we found for a sample you did not see many people who were always single so almost everyone has a background of divorce or widowhood. So it could be interesting to look at comparisons between those two groups. Mm -hmm. uh, but we, there were very, and I think this is sort of consistent with trends that a lot of people marry at some point in their lifetime. Um, but yeah, it, we did not have uh, older folks who had never been married, uh, you know, but were dating in, in later life in these new relationships. Yeah, but that that would be really interesting. That was something the grant reviewers actually were freaking out about <laughs> that they were like those are weirdos and I was like well let's not be so derogatory <laughs> but yeah it turns out um first of all recruiting older dating couples to be in your study is really hard because telling new couples do you want to come to our labs and talk about your relationship on camera no they don't <laughs> uh, but we did yeah so but uh yeah it can be a tough tough thing to do any any Final questions? Well, thank you all for a great panelists. So appreciate it. And uh, we'll look forward to our, our next panels in a few weeks or a couple of weeks. I don't know how many on health. So there'll be some folks. All right, great. Thank you. Thank you.